You're not alone. If you need someone to talk to today, please contact Crisis Services Canada by either calling them at 1-833-456-4566 all hours of the day. Or you can text them at 45645 at 4 p.m. to 12 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Remember you're not alone, and Crisis Services Canada is here to help. The FHN Network is sponsored in part by HODL Services. If you're looking for a disc jockey, karaoke host, video jockey to videographer, our company can help. With over 20 years of experience, we would be happy to help with your special event within Ontario, Canada. You can contact us at 226-988-2895 or visit us at our website at hodlservices.vpweb.ca. That's H-O-D-D-L-E Services. We look forward to hearing from you and helping with your special event. What's up, OTP fans, and thanks for tuning in to our live recording of Season 3, Episode 13 of Off the Puck Hockey. I'm your host, Tyler Fines. You can catch us on Rogers TV, Channel 20, Channel 13 in the Tri-City area, London, St. Thomas. Make sure Saturday nights, 9 p.m., you're turning on your TV and checking us out. If you want to follow us, make sure you follow all of our social media pages, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Make sure that you view our recordings Monday nights live 9 p.m. unedited. Check it out. Tonight, we're wondering where the, my the mystery man is tonight. Mr. Styles couldn't make her, but it's all right. I do know one co-host I made it tonight, Mr. <laughs> Mike the Winner Walker. What's going on, fella? Not too much, Feinze. Um, Just happy to be here. Too bad I missed the last one. That was a doozy of a of an episode for sure. Yeah, it was nice having Theo Fleury on. He did. A, he was a hell of a guest. But uh, we got a great guest tonight. But before we get to our guest here, uh, how the team playing the weekend? Are we winning games? Still winning games. Um, we're one point out of first place right now. Uh, but we we beat first place on Sunday, so things are looking good. Uh, Four zero and one <clears> in the last five. So we're right there. <laughs> Out of boy, we'll keep the keep it rolling, buddy. You never know. You still got a long, still a long season, but as long as you're winning hockey games, it's always fun. But tonight, listen, we welcome. Uh, we've got a great guest on tonight, guys. We're welcoming former professional hockey player, current assistant coach in the queue with St. John's Sea Dogs, second round pick to Columbus, Mister Stefan Legion. What's up, fella? Not much. How you guys doing? Well, we're excited to have you on. I'm really, really looking forward to talking a little bit about junior hockey out in Quebec and kind of what you're, you know, what you dealt with over the last two years with COVID. And because obviously your situation was a lot different than uh, that was going on here. But before we get into that, just, you know, where are you at right now? Uh, yeah, I'm in St. John coaching the Sea Dogs. Uh, it's a pretty exciting year. Obviously, we were fortunate enough to be hosting the Memorial Cup. So it's nice to have that kind of. Uh, motivation for the end of the year and one common thing that everyone's pushing for knowing that will be there so it's been good it's uh, the season got off to a little bit of a slow start but you know slowly we've been building our structure and the team's starting to play well and looking forward to uh what's to come so how did you end up landing the uh, the coaching gig out there i was skating a kid that played out there from ontario nick deacon poot and i was talking to him about his coaches and he said they were looking for a coach i asked for his coach's email emailed him and we started talking and then from there i got the job so i told my wife we were moving to saint john and now we have a house and we live here for eight or nine months of the year now you gotta now i gotta ask about the housing prices there's got to be a major difference from ontario to get a house out west or so out east yeah no it was uh 
it's you know it was cost two thousand dollars to rent versus a five hundred dollar mortgage so <laughs> it's kind of a no-brainer and prices are insane yeah it's a down payment for a, a whole piece of property <laughs> my house here is way bigger than my house in toronto as well and it's like i said it's less than the down payment so that's insane that's great though yeah. it's a it's, a, it's an awesome it's opportunity nice. to be able to work like that well, it is good because, you know, the CHL is not exactly the place where assistant coaches get rich. So it's nice to be able to work in a place where housing is affordable and it's a little bit easier to to make that move with my wife and three kids to, to St. John. Awesome. Absolutely. Steph, I'm just going to throw it back here. Kind of um, where did the game of hockey start for you and, you know, kind of how did it um, become a first love for you? <clears throat> It started, uh, like, I grew up in Oakville and started just playing, you know, house league at, at first and started doing well and then started just, you know, falling in love with playing the game every winter and it became really all we did. And I had uh, two brothers and it's all they did. So we were just, you know, a typical Canadian family at the time. Just everyone played hockey. We We watched it. We played it all the time. It's all we did all winter. We didn't ski or do anything like that we just played hockey and as it went along I got better and as I got better obviously the passion grew and the the commitment level grew and it was you know kind of a an exciting journey from there but you know just it was a typical thing just you know minor hockey in your hometown and that was it absolutely then you got up into uh you know first year of junior hockey you played in the OJ there um Kind of what was that experience like going into a, you know, a room of, you know, 20 year old men and then expanding over to the OHL? How much of a difference was was that jump? That was good. The, the OJ was, it was a really good league at the time. I'm, it's, it's still a good league. I mean, it's, I think the, the quality of it has gone down, not to, to knock the league at all. But at, at the time there was, you know, constantly guys getting drafted into the NHL and there was a lot of good players and it was just a good league. It was really competitive. There was a lot of older guys. It was tough. It was physical. So the kind of go in right from playing minor midget to playing that was, it was good. And there was a lot of good teams in the division we were in in Milton playing the blades and Georgetown and teams like that. So, you know, it was tough and it was physical. And I think it really got me ready to go play in the OHL at 16. Yeah, for sure. What? Yeah, for me, what's it like playing in Mississauga? And and I know that a lot of these teams, especially now that the Steelheads back, uh, they were the Ice Dogs when you were playing. But you know, it was really tough to, to drum up fans back in the day. Was this kind of similar when you were playing there? Or more playing more more years playing in front of family. No, we actually had uh, my first year there. We had like a lot of games that were sold out, like standing room only. When you know when Sully and Wolski would go at it, it was you know packed to the to the brim and you know playoffs was always rammed and and then i don't know what happened it's slowly uh it's slowly our team you know obviously we went through a junior cycle we were really good that my first year with o'sullivan and carcillo and hekimovic and quincy and you know we so then the next year we weren't as good and i don't know the fans just kind of dropped off and the, the hockey in brampton kind of dropped off as well and the rivalry kind of died and I think hockey in the area just kind of became less of a priority and it's kind of been that way ever since, unfortunately. I can't believe how many good players were on that Milton team. First, Shandor Alfonso. Yep. Fantastic. Refs in the NHL. Yeah. Brett Robinson, Orangeville yep. boy, played with him growing up. John Tavares. Yep. John Tavares, and the John Tavares, there. Sam Gagne. Yeah. Right? Like, just unbelievable list of guys to, to be able to play for. Yeah. Well, I mean, at the time, if you got John, you had Sam, right? So, they were yeah. doing everything <laughs> together. So, no, they were – it was – yeah, it was awesome. Like, you know, being able to grow up and compete with those guys and stuff and, you know, work out with Sam as long as I did and to skate with John in the summer. And it was just, you know, I obviously wasn't the caliber, but it definitely pushed me to be – what I was and it, it definitely enhanced my career being able to be around guys like that from such a young age and right from the start of my career. 
It's crazy. I was going to yeah, actually touch in, on, touch in on that uh, up in Oakville there. You guys had that uh, BTNL training. Um, <laughs> yeah. How much did that talk, help? Let's not talk about the BTNL part, but let's talk about the player part. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, we it was awesome. Like I said, we had some we had some good guys that we worked out in skating. And Johnny never really uh, was working out with us. He was at ATC. Um, but it was more the skates we were able to get in that area and, you know, with mind and muscle and, you know, the the GTA at that time was just so heavily populated with good hockey players. It was so easy to get to get into good skates and even, you know, you could find them everywhere. They were in Oakville and they were, you know, everywhere. There was NHL guys and OHL guys and, you know, all the best of the best skating. And you could just find awesome action on the ice all the time. So it was, it was an easy environment if you were willing to get better, to get better in. Yeah, absolutely. So kind of what was your, you know what, you came through and you're one, you know, you weren't the best kid. When I talk about the best kid, you had skill, but you just, you know, you weren't a point guy. You're, you know, that energy guy, you know, how did your coaches kind of shape you into being that type of player? And why was it so effective to help you kind of get to where you were? Cause a lot of those guys don't end up going in the second round of Columbus. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I was never really a point guy, like growing up in minor hockey, it wasn't, I wasn't like dominating. My my minor midget stats were like a point a game, which is you know, it's fine. It's great. Like Toronto Red Wings. Uh, yeah, like I was able to get a, a goal or an assist or a second assist every game. Like it wasn't that dominant. So I think early on I just understood the value of the two hundred foot game and I bought into the the value and other things and I took it to heart when I played and it was important to me to to stop goals and to stop people from scoring. And it was fun to to piss guys off and you know, hit them from behind or slew foot them or stuff like that. Like I just took, it's, it's bad, it's dirty, but like I just took pride in little things like that. And I, I liked it from right away. And I, I found a little niche for myself. And then I was able through hard work to add the offensive ability as I got older and it, it all combined for me. And, it became a nice little package, and unfortunately, I stopped working as hard as I did to become that little package. But you know, when I was I was on, it was good, a good combination. Absolutely. Going into your uh, your draft year there, um, second round pit or so yeah, second round there. Kind of was it um, was it Columbus all the way going in, or was there other teams that expressed interest in you outside of? <laughs> Yeah, like I, it's kind of a it's a crazy story. It sounds like a fisherman's tale, but right before the draft started, the uh, I, uh, you know from the area, Colin Campbell's a good friend, so he was at the draft, and we were talking with my dad and him. They grew up together, and he had said he'd just talked to the Leafs, and they were committed to taking me at thirteen. And shortly after, I got mucked up by Leafs TV, so everything seemed kind of set in stone that I was going to go 13th to the Leafs. And that was my central scouting ranking, uh, the final rank. So I was like, oh, this is awesome. I had a friend there who was, you know, best best buddy my whole life, diehard Leaf fan. So it was like, all right, this is going to be one hell of a night. Like, here we go. <laughs> but <clears throat> that pick number nine, they traded the pick. And, you know, there was a lot of curse words into the Leaf TV mic after that. And... <laughs> From there, it was, you know, I thought the Rangers maybe would have taken me, but the draft had kind of gone sideways. Hickey got taken fourth, and then it threw everyone's list off. And the Russians were kind of, there was a, it was a year where they weren't really honoring, letting them out of their deals to come over to the NHL. So Cherapanov went at 17 to the Rangers. And, you know, then from there, after I got into the second round and I, once it got to Columbus, I knew I was going to go there because a scout, was from Oakville, uh, Dave McNamara. And I was, he had looked, I was sitting right in front of their, behind their table. And right when their pick came, he kind of turned around and he was like, yeah, we're picking you. And I was like, oh, great. <laughs> Here we go. And it was, but it was great. Like the draft was in Columbus. So we got, you know, a nice little cheer from the fans that were there. Got to go right into the dressing room and up into the owner's box and meet everyone. And so it was a great experience. It was awesome. Like, it would have been nice to go on the Friday night, but to go into the to the team that you were where the draft is being held was pretty nice as well. 
that's cool. Yeah, for sure. yeah, what a cool experience. That is a crazy. That is a crazy story, though. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was a whirlwind. That's for sure. <laughs> and then going into that next year, you made the World Junior roster, and I. Uh, yeah, that was also was, a whirlwind. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was. I was hoping that uh, Adam was here for this because we were laughing at it today. Uh, the vintage Gino Retta interview that you threw up there. Yeah. Um, you were pretty laid back where, you know, you had Johnny T who was so serious about everything. Um, how did that affect that room and you guys winning, just being so laid back the way you were? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think anytime you can keep a group light and, and it wasn't just me, it was, uh, we had unbelievable chemistry, that team. And, you know, especially we lost the first game. So to be able to rally back after that, and, you know, we had a goalie change from Bernier to Mason and, Marshawn had a big turnover and everyone was kind of all over him in the media. And it was just, the group was just able to really come together in a common thing. And I think there was a lot of us that kept it light between me and Marshy and Luke Shen. And, you know, there was just a lot of guys who were personalities and, and really fun. And, and then we had the skill like Giroux, Marshawn, Turris, Johnny T, Stamkos, Doughty, Subban, like, you know, Simon, the list goes on with the team. It yeah. was, you know, it's, it's not the best because of that one team with Crosby and all those guys, but <laughs> it's up there in one of the better teams that's been assembled at the World Juniors in terms of guys who had NHL careers, I think, when you look back on it. So it was some it, it was crazy to be a part of thinking about it today. So, you know, while we're while we're here, while we're here, we might as well uh, we might as well reminisce on it. So I think we're going to uh, send it over to, to John Tavares. <laughs> Nice to play for the World Junior team and uh, first experience as well. Let's talk about the team. Who do you say the call to on this squad is? I have to say probably Claude Giroux. What makes Claude such a cool dude? Like this potato and egg. So, John, we went to the team in go karting and uh, that you didn't have too impressive a finish. Would you care to elaborate on that? Yeah, I, I probably should work on getting my license. <laughs> uh, are you old enough to have your license, John? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> On the ice, I understand they have some great hands. How come you went up for four and break this stuff? You got great hands, you got a great shot. Well, Gino, I got a question for you. How does it feel to grow, grow that duster back? Uh, you know, it feels good. Uh, Luke Shen was telling me to grow the muzzy back, so uh, I got it in there, started growing it, started shaving it, putting some uh, dresser men in there to make it nice and black. And uh, it's looking good, you know, I think it's really coming along. It should be nice uh, by the end of the tournament, really thick and full like Georgie Perros. <laughs> Oh, uh, it's funny. Man. A lot of my life is because of that interview. It's, you know, it's, <laughs> quickly, you know, it's, it gave me a reputation with TSN, which then, you know, kind of gave me a little bit of a platform where they kept following me around and <laughs> maybe should have been an announcer. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe, but I like being a coach. Yeah. Well, you know what? Um, let's talk a bit about that. Cause obviously there was some huge news today. In the, yeah. in the NHL world. Obviously, everyone knows what's going on. Vancouver cleans house. Yeah. Vancouver cleans house. Let's talk about them before we move on to Philly and L.A. and Vigneault's departure from uh, from Philly. But, you know, you're in the queue. You know it's a business. You What have you learned about being a coach over the last four years on the business side? Yeah, I mean, it's challenging. Like, owners have expectations. Fans have expectations. Teams are, are building things around winning at certain times. And... You know, in the NHL, obviously, it's amplified and, you know, they've invested a lot of money in their teams. And so when things don't go well, there's, you know, unfortunately, not a lot of decisions that can be made that can change the course of a hockey team. And a lot easier than trading out players and making those things work are, are we letting coaches go and general managers. And, you know, sometimes they become the scapegoats. And, you know, sometimes good players just need to shake up, but sometimes, you know, good players are just letting you down and it's unfortunate for, for the guys who got fired. I, I played for Travis green on, on a short term basis on a PTO in Utica and, you know, he's a good coach. I know he, he demands hard work and all that. So, you know, you can't really fault him for trying and it's just an unfortunate business at times. Like I said, there's, there's not many guys who can get chopped and as a coach, you're one of them and it's an easy, it's an easy solution for, for management. 
kind of makes you nervous talking about it, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll tell you, it was, I, had said, I already said it from the beginning. I thought they, I thought that they let that go its course. Like, I really believe that they should have made a change early in the year. Would have been fair to Travis. Would have been fair to Benning. And I don't know, there's no fair in the, in the hockey world. You know this. It just it is what it is, and they want to give him a shot. Um, the only thing I didn't piece together, and I'm hoping one of you guys can piece together, was I saw that the coach was fired first. I did not see that the Benning was fired. I saw the coach was gone. So what I yeah. wanted to know was whose decision was that? And if it was Benning's decision, did they walk down and can Bennett? I don't know. Did, did anyone see, put those two together? You know what? I didn't. I haven't really listened to too much on it. I, I was thirty You're busy. Thoughts guys were saying that it uh, it was kind of weird that it broke first about Green, but I mean who knows with the media right it's it's however they it comes out and then it's in the eye of everyone who reads it it could have people could have known about benning first but they just cared more about the green side of it and that yeah. was a bigger story you know who i don't really i don't really i don't think it matters at the end of the day but you know no i the think only, you knew the both of them were going the both only, of them were going down no matter what like, the only three reason it kind of mattered to me stuff was because you know, obviously that was, I just wanted to know if that's what caused the firing. Like, or all of a sudden, like, was that one of the reasons? Obviously they were having a terrible year. They were, they were, they can't, Pedersen's doing nothing. I'm already here. Everyone knows my opinion on Bull Horb. I think he's a hell of a hockey player, but I don't think he's ever going to win anything. No disrespect. The kid's a beauty. He's a hell of a hockey player. But just, there's guys that just don't, I don't have the feeling that they can ever win. Yeah. You know, you just have to have that feeling about guys that they can, that eventually they're going to win. Yeah, against the guys sure. like Alex Ovechkin, you knew he was going to win. Patrick Kane, he was going to win. Crosby, you know, I think McDavid's going to win. I don't necessarily think he's going to be with Edmonton, but I think McDavid is going to win <laughs> eventually. But you never yeah. know. But I don't the know. Watch, what do you think? Yeah, I'll win the Olympics. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that counts. <laughs> no, I mean, it's uh, – yeah, like I said, like, it comes down to the players a lot of it at the end of the day. They're the ones who put the product in place. It's the coach's job to make sure that they know the information. And I think more so in pro hockey than junior, it's it's their job to to understand it and do the job. And like I said, it's just it becomes a scape it's a scapegoat for the coaches and it's it's unfortunate. And you know, maybe there's more to the story and you know, maybe Bruce Boudreau coming in and he has a reputation with good players, so maybe he'll get guys going and it'll be really successful and that's all some teams need, but you know, it's a lot of it's just about timing. It's, you know, look at the Islanders. They finals two years in a row, and now they can't win a game in 11. So, yeah, it's, it's a challenging business. It's it's tough to get two points every night. It's it's a lot of good players. It's a lot of parity. It's, you know, everyone's working hard. Everyone's studying the tape. It's it's hard to win. It's, it's a challenge at our level even, and you amplify it at every level you go up. So it's – it's tough. So yeah, I agree. What kind of um, what kind of things do you does your team specifically use? You know, to maybe gain an advantage over another team, whether it be through a, a coaching game plan or or video that you guys use. Yeah, we use a lot of instat. Um, we're fortunate with our team. We have a great owner who gives us all the tools we need, so we use instat. Um, just gives us great access to clipping other teams and being able to quickly break them down. And then our league as well takes a lot of pride in having good technology. So we use uh, what's called Catapult now, but it used to be called Exos and gives us iPads on the bench and all that. But, you know, with us, it's it's a lot about consistency and just being able to to break teams down in a similar way and deliver the message to our players that it's, it's concise and this is how we want to do things. And, we're going to make sure that they know the message simple and clear and they're able to go out on the ice and execute it. So for us, the ability to pull things together quickly using the Instat and the Exos, and we have a really good video coach in St. John who, who gets the clips together and they're all ready to find and it's easy. So, you know, our, our ability to get things to the players quick is definitely our advantage. And, you know, as our team gets better, the players get better, they're able to take in more knowledge and it just becomes even more of a, an advantage to us as a staff to to get them the information quick. What have you learned about yourself 
um, out, obviously coming out, you're a professional <clears throat> hockey player. You really see now, obviously going from one extreme to the next. You know, what have you learned about yourself as a coach that maybe you didn't know when you were a player? Yeah, I think I was just really – I wasn't as coachable as I thought. Like, you know, there's there's a lot that goes into the relationship between a player and a coach, and a lot of emphasis is put on the coach's willingness to, you know, give input and do the extra work. But I think a lot of it goes on the player as well. And I think as a coach, that's what I've learned. If, if you're going to put in work with someone, if they're not going to reciprocate the, the level of commitment to what you're doing, it's it's not going to really go anywhere. So I really learned that about myself. And, you know, that's, you know, as you become a coach, you can really dissect your own career. And I think that's one of the ways that, that I was wrong. And, you know, I fought with a lot of coaches as a player and I argued with them on the bench in the dressing room, you know, <laughs> about their decision-making and, you know, and it was just, it was just being lazy on my part, really. And being a coach now, I kind of see that. And it's it's brutal some nights when you have to think about it. But it's you nice open the door able. and I'm walking through it, okay? I need to have an example. Like, do you Can you recall a time when, again, I, and where and when or, and who it was where you kind of mm. like went either overboard or decided, like, today's the day I'm laying the hammer down on this coach because he's a fucking idiot? Oh, yeah. I had this Mark Morris in Manchester in the American League when I was playing with L.A. And you know, I played well for him at one point. And then you know, the American League's a really cutthroat league. It's a lot of what have you done for me lately. And I definitely wasn't the best version of myself. I was spending a lot of time in the bars and doing stuff like that. So, like, I, you know, a lot of it, again, comes down to me. But we were kind of getting at it. We had a lot of meetings that just didn't make sense where we'd go back and forth and then playoffs, he healthy scratch came in and wrote the lineup for the next night. It was a quick turnaround and he wrote out the lines and I wasn't in it. And I just kind of stood up and I was like, are you fucking kidding me? Like, this is a fucking joke. And then he's like hallway right now. And then we were kind of face to face in the hall and, then I knew my time in LA was done. So <laughs> it was, uh, yeah, it was, so that was definitely the, the worst one, but it was just a lot of arrogance, you know, in junior, my last year with Mario Chiquillo, I just, you know, going, I know out, of Mario. My, going out, going out of my way to make him look bad, you know, I know Mario water. pretty, I know Mario well, that's funny. Yeah, smacking <laughs> water bottles off the bench, just, uh, you know, just dumps like, Stuff that I thought was funny, but, you know, just really, if you could tell the kids one thing, it's, it's pretty stupid. Like <laughs> anything that you think is cool is definitely the wrong decision for most kids these days. Well, it's I good that you, you've been it, That's awesome, though, that you've got, kind of, like I said, you learn from it. You, you're now able to communicate that to your guys. And um, you know, yeah, for me, I mean, yeah, it's crazy. It was too late for me, and that's the main message. Like, we got to figure this out fast, or it's gone f quick. Just... With, with how uh, robotic these kids are these days, and how you know they're they're taught right from twelve, thirteen, to say the right thing at the right time. Um, say you had a kid who you know went overboard at at you for not playing them. How would you kind of try to reel them in before? He said, all right, hit the road. <laughs> yeah, I mean, definitely as an assistant coach, it's a little different that way. Um, you know, the head coach would decide. I, I run the D, so I have a little bit more decision-making in that regard. I'm putting out guys on the ice, but I haven't really run across that issue yet, which is fortunate for me. I have six guys who are pretty understanding of their minutes, and some guys play a lot and some guys play a little, and – you know, I haven't really had to deal with it, but you know, I think everything's situational. I don't think there's a, a black and white answer for anything when you're dealing with people. It's, you know, heat of the game. It's it's who the kid is. What are they going through? You know, what just happened? You know, it's kind of everything. How are you talking to them? Because maybe you're talking to them like a bit of a dickhead and you deserve to be talked back to because, you know, they should be respected as well at times. And, you know, so it's it's kind of a – it's in every situation is different to me. And, you know, you – you want to give every kid the benefit of the doubt. You don't want to really break anybody down because at the end of the day, they're still kids. It's not professional hockey. They're not paid to be there. They're for some of them, this is the peak of their, their hockey life. So you've got to make it enjoyable as well. So. Absolutely. 
Y'all want to fight? I was going to say, what, you don't want to talk anymore, Walker? You don't hey, talk go anymore? for it. Go for it. That was tough. <laughs> that was tough. Right? Like, you know, okay. All right. Then. Anyways, listen, you got a couple of really good players. you got a kid named Willem DeFore on your team. Yeah. You know, talk a little bit about a couple of the guys on your home. I know you can't take – I know you don't want – you know you're the coach. You can't pick out guys. But, you know, just talk about a couple of the guys on your team you think that have been really – you know, have a real good shot at uh, playing some high-end hockey here. Yeah, I mean, well, you just said William DeFore. Obviously, he's going to World Junior Camp. He's a, a big, strong, powerful kid. He's 6'5", and, you know, 200 and something pounds. And he takes the puck to the net, and he's got a big, heavy shot. And he's a lot to handle. And, you know, it's on nights where he's playing that way, it's, it's like I said, it's a problem for other teams, especially, you know, for kids at the junior level. He's a man's body, and he carries himself like a man on the ice at times, and it's hard and so he's something special and you know we have some guys on the back end as well that are signed uh Villeneuve and Poirier Poirier is uh quite the offensive talent and he can he can really move around with the puck on the ice and put it in the back of the net and Villeneuve's become you know pretty efficient at exiting with the puck and and breaking up plays with his stick so you know it's nice to watch guys develop and for me I've been here the whole time with a lot of them since 16 so it's nice to see them sign contracts and, you know, I know Dufour just got added here, but it's nice to, in the short time that I've known him to see him have success in his career. And, you know, hopefully he can go and make the world junior team and, you know, really make a name for himself and push to sign in the NHL and hopefully get that chance to be a professional hockey player. Uh, and, you know, I want to go and kind of go back to your career and talk just a little bit about, um, you know, going through the, going through the professional ranks and, you know, you get drafted in the second round. OK, there's a lot of I still feel like even in the top three rounds, top two in particular, there's a lot of pressure from agents, from coaches, from players to try to, you know, mold you into a player to be able to play at the next level. Do you feel like you got that support and that encouragement to try to get there or like what, what was kind of missing in your game that just, you know, I just it just did not get me there? Yeah, no, like I, I think I had all the support. My family was incredible. They, you know, anytime I. I went to BTNL, which wasn't cheap. You know, there was a lot of extra ice at the time. You know, it wasn't as big of a thing. And, you know, BTNL had a lot of things going on. And so there's a lot of money involved. And my parents were great in that regard. And that definitely gave me a huge advantage to be able to attend stuff like that. And, you know, it was just, uh, I don't know. It was, it was, I honestly lost my train of thought, to be honest. <laughs> They're just trying to get, you know what, just trying to get you back on, you know, just even, you know, just like what would any pressure, like did you, like what kind of pressure were you feeling, you know, some nights, like just trying to go out there and at least do, you know, whether it's put up a point, throw a hit, just something to get you going. Yeah, I, I think the pressure in junior was to leave junior. Like you just wanted to get out of there. You wanted to show that you were the best and leave. Like that's how I felt every night, and especially my last year, my – my junior career was kind of weird. My first two years, I was really, I didn't do much. Like I was a decent penalty killer and I played, you know, average minutes and I didn't really get many points. And then I had a good year, my third year. And then my fourth year really took off for me. So, you know, it was, it was just a challenge to, to still want to stay in junior at that time. And knowing that I thought I was going to go to that next level. And then it was just kind of a rush to get there. And, I kind of got lost a little bit in that. And that was where a lot of the pressure came for me was trying to be that NHL player so quickly and trying to be the best. And, you know, everybody has that pressure on them to want to be the best. And I just took it really hard and to heart. And then it wasn't really going my way. And then it kind of spiraled a bit from there when I faced that adversity of not, not getting exactly what I wanted. And I faced it early and it, it kind of really knocked me back. Like how frustrating it would it was it it's not just for yourself but you also play with a guy that that I've always liked as a hockey player and Justin Azevedo. The yeah. Only problem with Justin was that he's five seven. He's yeah, no, five, he was seven. a great. We played on a line together. Uh, we had a great line. I had a great year in Manchester. Played the second half of the season with him and Trent Hunter, and he was awesome. And yeah, he had a he was, but you know, he's been able to have a great career for himself in Russia. He makes 
ton of money. Yeah, he's and now a well, now he's star over there. Yeah, now he's in the Swiss League. But I was just, I was always like, man, like if if he can't make it with the amount of points that he put up in the A and his work ethic, and you know, and even not even given a, getting a sniff, I could just imagine what it would be like for second, third line guys just trying to, like I said, just trying to put it together. Like I'm this close, I'm right there. And he can't. Get you got to be really good, though, to get know. points in the NHL. And once you <laughs> once you're kind of that point producer, you're you're going up against some pretty elite players. So for Azevedo at the time, he's got to go up and play in the top six. And LA Kings top six centermen, uh, you know, Kopitar and Carter. you know they had Carter, Richards, guys like that, and yeah. Yeah. Dustin you're not, Brown, you're not Jarrett Stoll. Like even you know he's not even better than their third line guy. Like it's it was a tough team for him to crack, and a lot of it's all about opportunity. And you know I, I think about Sam Gagne at the draft um, when Washington picked at number five. They accidentally said from London at first, and then they ended up picking Alsner. And then Sam went the next pick to Edmonton. And there's not really a chance, I don't think, that Sam would have played in the NHL at 18 for Washington, just the way they were built. But he got a chance to play with Edmonton, and his career was kick-started early. And it was just kind of that timing piece of it all. And, you know, it's, it's so much about opportunity at the right time. For sure. Going into, um, you know, you said there was a lot of added, added pressure to yourself. Um, you had the early retirement there. Yeah. Did that – what kind of um, brought that about? And did, do you find that that maybe put a little bit of a dent in your opportunity to go to the NHL? Oh, yeah. Well, like that literally ruined every <laughs> opportunity that I had to fucking play in the NHL. That was – this. Is, if you want to play in the NHL, don't do that. <laughs> 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 that's for sure. No, that's uh, I don't see any other reason. Because even when I first went to the American League, I had 27 goals as a rookie. Like, fuck, I think I would have got a chance then. Yeah. But like I, after that, I was just I was done. Like, but I was a bad. Like again, it go, goes plays into me too. Like I was a bad person at the time too. Wasn't a bad teammate, but I was just you know living a bad lifestyle I, as an athlete. I wasn't taking it serious. I wasn't. So as, as much as I can say it was, I was blackballed for a decision I made. I also made a bunch of choices that further blackballed me myself. So, you know, what though? and it's usually those are the guys that turn it around, right. And have the successful mm -hmm. off ice careers, you know, like look at guys like flurry who, yeah, he had an awesome, yeah. he he's a you know, top end career, like a little bit different story, but you know, but he, he fought his demons and he's trying to, you know, he's trying to change his life. And there's a ton of guys, Jim Thompson's probably the best example of that being drafted. The only guy ever to be drafted by every expansion team in the nineties. <laughs> that's his record. That's his, only, that's his NHL record to draft to every team. No, <laughs> that's crazy. No, it's uh it's an interesting business, man. It's tough. It's what tough. the you know, what, so what's kind of your plan? Like are you gonna are you you know you you think you want to be a hockey guy the rest of your life? Like you but you've obviously taken the commitment. And I want to talk a little bit about being an assistant coach because it's so important for people to understand, especially at juniors, what exactly it is to be an assistant coach. It is not like I don't want to say it's not fun because it's fun, but it is not a breeze that it is work. It is a grind and there's a lot of pressure on you, but uh, you know, you know what, let's just touch on that then, you know, what's it like being an assistant coach and kind of like a daily day, day to day basis for you? Yeah. I mean, well, working with the D it's, it's a lot of specific work with the D so, you know, watching their shifts, cutting their video. We have a, a defensive consultant that I work with in St. John, <laughs> Paul Bout Boutelier played in the NHL for a long time. He coached here in St. John with Thomas Shabbat and Zaboral and a bunch of good players. And he works with a bunch of guys independently. So uh, between him and I, we, we piggybacked off each other and worked this program in St. John with the D. So that's mainly my focus. And uh, I also do power play. And aside from that, it's just really, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's assisting the head coach. It's, you know, doing pre-scout clips so he can kind of come in and watch him and and put that finishing touch on our game plan and it's setting it up so it runs smoothly every day it's like I said it's a lot of un unbeautiful work like nobody you know it's, it's not great a lot of the times like you said it's it's hard and it's it's ugly and it's a lot of time spent in an office and 
staring at a computer screen and your eyes are hurting and you know you're you're real tired from watching the computer so much but it's it just it's what needs to be done if a team is going to be successful i think and you're looking for you're looking forward to getting on the ice and practicing every day after staring at that computer and the Oh yeah, it's, and you know that's one of the perks too to be able to get to go on the ice and be physically active every day and and mix it up with the players in that kind of environment and to have that kind of fun and you know our our coaching staff is pretty young and vibrant and we like to have a a good time while well, you know we're very serious at the same time I don't want to say but you know we like to get involved with the players in that regard so it's fun to be it's fun to be active with the guys and taking passes and one timers and face offs and all that stuff so it's it's a, it's a really cool job to be able to to be on the ice with high level athletes like that and hopefully can continue working work my way up to being on the ice with the best absolutely is there um you know like you said you like to have fun in practices and stuff is there ever a time where you grab a forward you see struggling with something <laughs> obviously you were a forward growing up Say, hey, try this and, you know, just critique them as well as your, your D guys. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, – our staff is so detailed that it's hard for anything to get missed by those guys. They're they're pretty on the ball. We have uh, our head coach is Gordy Dwyer, and he's coached for a long time. Was We talked about it before we started. Uh, just won the under-18s and a great staff there. And, and then we have another, Travis Crickard, who was coaching Waterloo Wolves, actually, and – midget team in that area and he's worked in Kelowna and been with Hockey Canada and they're you know they're like I like to claim to be a hard working group and they don't miss much similar to like I say I don't miss much with the D they don't miss much with the forwards but we're very much a staff in the sense that everybody kind of picks up on everything if something's missed the information is provided so it's always it's always good it's you're, you're doing something different every day whether it's you know having a conversation about the penalty kill because you're trying to figure something out or I'm asking for help on the power play and you know we're all just trying to figure out what's best for the team so it's it's a nice environment to be able to have that and it's it's one united group doing everything and it's good yeah for sure uh -huh. is there ever um you know a chance where you're gonna say hey I might take a gig as a head coach and you know how how your structure of that be compared to what you're a part of now if i was going to be a head coach yeah i mean i i think our team is built on a lot of the principles that i would have it's we're straightforward we're we're detail oriented and it's it's not overly complicated i mean you know i haven't put too much thought into being a head coach honestly i've i've really enjoyed being an assistant and you know, it's something I've talked with other people about is you know, every team needs assistance. It's it's a valuable role. I, I really enjoy currently working with the D personally. So, you know, it's something that I wouldn't mind doing my whole career at the moment. You know, maybe that changes. Who knows? I'm, I'm yeah. still young. and But I haven't really honestly put too much thought into being a head coach. But, you know, a lot of the things that we're doing now, because we're we're hosting the Memorial Cup, we've brought in people that, you know really all on the same page i think a lot of the philosophies would align awesome you know yeah uh, we can sorry mike i'll let you finish there but uh we have a guy like dave matzos who i who i work with you know he was head coach of, of sudbury and head coach of hamilton and you know he'll tell you like you know there's a lot of guys that like you said enjoy being assistants they just were not built made to be head coaches dave's a little different scenario he was born to be that way but some guys like um uh you know like brad like brad, that was playing brad shaw Life yeah. or, like, lifetime assistant coach loves the job that doesn't have all the pressure on him and he puts trust in the people around him and you know what it's true it is very hard to be an assistant coach i'm the first one to tell you because i'm not a good assistant coach i try my best but i'm not a good assistant coach no it is hard and you know you have to really put your ego aside at times and you have to be able to like a player take criticism because at the end of the day it's the head coach signing his name to what goes out on the ice so you're just another cog in the wheel so you have to be you know, as ego free as possible. And as much as you might think something, it's, it doesn't benefit anyone to have differing opinions, really, you have to try and sync up as quick as possible while understanding that the guy above you is paid to know that that's what should be done. And, 
uh, on our staff, our opinion is always valued, but you know, at the end of the day, it's the head coach making those, those tough decisions. Yeah, for sure. That's uh, the one thing, this is my first year as a head coach and um, my one assistant coach, you know, he draws up some lines and stuff and, you know, switches a couple players here and there. And it's like, like, I'm not trying to be a dick. I just want your input as to why. And that's my question to why did you make that change? So yeah, and, no, it's, and it's looking really well with it. <laughs> it's got to be collaborative. Like it just doesn't work to have, to have guys trying to do their own separate things. It's confusing to the players and, if the players are confused, then you're never going to get anything accomplished. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. No, good. Listen, you, I I wish you all the best, and I really hope that uh, you know you continue to grow as a coach, continue to grow yourself as a, as a person, and uh, you know, and like I said, keep send keep spreading that message about when you were younger, because I I truly believe that that's the message that all the players that you're going to touch over your you know or you know mentally over the next few years is going to be fantastic. Like I really believe that you can have that type of impact with that type of story, especially with those kids that are going to be going through the draft like you are. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a simple message. It's, it's hard work is everything. It's commitment to the craft. If you want it, you have to do it every day. You have to breathe it. And it doesn't mean that you can't have fun. Like it doesn't the fun and hard work are so often now they can't be associated with each other, but it's, it's fun to work hard. And I think that's what made myself successful. And a lot of the guys that I knew successful is they saw the fun and the hard work. And the second I lost that, it was over for me. So that's really the main, that's the key to it all. Well, it's good you recognized it. And like I said, Stefan, we're really appreciative of you coming on tonight. And, uh, and again, if there's anything we can do for you in the future, we'd love to have you back. So thanks so much for coming on tonight. Perfect. Thanks guys. Appreciate it. Yeah, you have a good night, sir, and good luck for the rest of, with the rest of the season. You too. Enjoy, guys. Thanks, Steph. Appreciate it. Yeah, Steph and no Legion, everybody from the QMHL St. John's Sea Dogs. <laughs> oh, beauty! No, that was that was good. I'm, I always love love getting into assistant coaches like that, and you know, just speaking with them and finding out kind of what their what their passions are, and kind of how they got there, and you know, and one thing I forgot to ask him—we already asked him about uh, Benning and, and what happened in Vancouver, but we should talk about. We got to talk about Vigneault getting canned in Philadelphia. Like, what the hell happened there? I mean, I think that uh, that team has been bad for a while, and Adam and I were talking about it today. Like, is it the goaltending the issue, or is it the defense? Like, it's just. It just remember doesn't when, seem to be clicking in Philly. <laughs> remember when Carter Hart was the new Carey Price? Oh, <laughs> supposed to be, <laughs> right? Yeah, right. Exactly. Like yeah. he was the he was supposed to be the guy. Yeah, the big saver. And he's not the guy. Yeah, and I don't know what to say. Like Claude Giroux is leading their team with 19 points. The next guy down's got 14 with Couturier. Like, oh man, he's more of a he's more of a defensive centerman than he is a an offensive guy too yeah you know well he's a minus eight so that's not working no um <laughs> i don't know like i don't i'm looking down the lineup just to take a look i mean kevin hayes has only played four games he's hurting out obviously he had a terrible tragedy i mean that's got to be weighing on him too um you know you traded your first overall pick you know morgan frost is not panning out the way you want mm -hmm. james van der Dyke's still there I mean, yeah, like, he's he's another one, right? Where the the younger generation is just it seems too fast for him. Yeah, it's not uh, it's not good there, and they decide to go another direction. And I don't, I, to be honest with you, I really don't blame Vino. I mean, you can only do so much with the team you have, and you know, I don't know who exactly you put the you put the blame into, but no, somebody's no. getting this. You know, someone's getting it. Yep. Right, like someone's getting, someone's getting it. So I don't know, uh, I don't know what you do in Philly outside of like hitting the, you know, hitting the, um, hitting the reset hit the button. button. <laughs> right, like that's all you can do is hit the is hit the reset button, and that's not fun for anybody. Like especially ownership. Like I gotta believe that if you own an HL team, the last thing you need is to have someone come to you and say, "Hey, uh, we need a, <laughs> we need a reset." <laughs> yeah by the way you're gonna lose five for five years we're gonna lose yeah and that's that's a tough thing because you're gonna definitely gonna lose some of that fan base there too right 
Yeah, you, you do lose a bit, but uh, but again, I think Philly will bounce back. They, they they're always kind of like that, but I'm really hoping that they can turn it around. It's just uh, they just need to need a reboot, and I'm hoping that they can do that, um, and and hopefully sooner than later. That's for sure. Um, yeah. Outside of that, man, it's been you know we, we had a couple. I don't know if you watched the game the other night with the with the knee on knee. Yeah. Do you think that was a knee from Pionk? Start first. Spezza is 100 percent knee. Yes. Pionk and knee. That's one of those situations he was I find he was going to make the hit and because Sandine made that little juke move on him it's that instinct to try to catch him because then he looks really bad if if he doesn't at least get a piece of him I don't think it was dude I don't think it was man I don't think so I think he missed I think Sandine ran into him that's my opinion. I think he just missed the hit, and as he was going by, I don't think he tried to throw it. I just think the way Sandine was shooting the shot and the way it came off his knee. Yeah, I, that's that's what I think. That's that what that's be. what I think happened. That's what I have. I don't. I have to go back and watch it again. I mean, you're right. Maybe I gotta go back and get another angle. I mean, he did get two games for it, so obviously they thought thought about it. So I mean, it is what it is, and. I, I didn't think it was a knee, but I'm uh, just hoping that Cindy comes back to the full recovery. Uh, we got a question coming in, and the question was on the comments is, what do you do about the Buffalo Sabres situation, um, and, you know, being where they are? And to be honest with you, I'm surprised they got eight wins. <laughs> I'm yeah, surprised I mean, they are where they are. I think they need to draft a, a young goalie and bring in an older vet. I mean, obviously they can – they could afford to do that with their cap space and just kind of groom something up that way, start from the cage and work their way out. Yeah, I, I guess. I, I don't really know. I just don't think they've got a ton of talent. So to have eight wins there and have, you know, two more than, than Montreal and two more than, than Ottawa. I mean, mm -hmm. I think the question is, is like, is how, why is Ottawa so bad? Cause I mean, you know, I hear people talking about DJ Smith and how good of a coach he is. Like the Ottawa's just not good. Like, let's be honest and, and to say what it is, like Ottawa's just not a good hockey team. They don't have anybody. Like, who's their guy? Well, I mean, for Stutzel, he's their guy. For for a guy like Matt Murray to win two Stanley Cups, go there and now be in the minor leagues is tells you something. <laughs> well, I think he was kind of on a down slope. Some some goalies get sure. like that. I think Cam Ward, maybe, you know, maybe I'm a little he's he get a little bit of a longer career, but I think Cam Ward was one of those guys. But yeah. I think in Ottawa, I mean, like you, you just don't have anybody. You got no talent there outside of Stutzel. And um, you know, I, I I'm not a Kachuk fan. I have a big Shabbat Kachuk fan. fan. <laughs> Have never been a Kachuk fan, and I don't want mean to say that, but you know Brady Kachuk, he's you know he's having an okay year. I just you know 16 points in 19 games. Um, you know Tim Stutzel, I think you know I think he's good, but I mean he's only got 11 and 22. Their best guy is Drake Batherson. He is their point leader. Yep. But you, but you just go down the list, and they just don't got they just don't have anybody. They really don't. That's the that's the sad part. They got no. They've got they just don't have enough talent, and. I don't know if he can fix and, – and as for the Buffalo Sabres, um, I think this is a good chance for them to try to – do I say rebuild? <laughs> I don't think I need to – I don't want to say rebuild. But, I mean, I don't know what you do. I mean, Kyle Pozo is leading your team in scoring. Yeah. And the other kicker is, like, how many times have they pulled the rebuild card? Well, this is a, yeah, and that's one thing about the rebuild. It's funny when I was mentioning in Ottawa that I didn't say was the GM said that the rebuild's over. Winning is now. Uh, I don't actually know about said that. that. He actually said that. There's a quote. Yeah, he actually said that. Quote unquote. That the winning is over. Or sorry, that the that the rebuild is over. Winning begins now. Hmm. Yeah. Quote unquote. I guess if that Forsberg kid keeps playing half decent, maybe they they win a few more. But I don't yeah. see them. I see them with a high draft pick. I'll go with that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know. Like, is there anybody else that's on the hot seat? Like, I mean, New Jersey's New Jersey's on their way up. Um, Montreal made their, you know, they've they've decided to, stay, you know, Ducharme's their guy, so he's not going anywhere. Um, <clears throat> you know, Chicago, Chicago, Chicago. I don't think they're doing much. Arizona is just terrible. Um, they made their move in Vancouver. Seattle's a new team. Um, uh, you know, LA's come come back down to earth now. They're three, four, and ten. In their last in their last ten ten games. You know, San Jose is kind of that. They're five and five in their last ten. They've lost two in a row, so they're starting to fall out of the out of the standings too. Yeah, I don't know who you, I don't know who you, what you do. I don't know what you do. You just continue. You know, I don't know who else is on the chopping block here. 
Yeah, at this point in time, anyways, right? No, that's true. Um, <clears throat> what was your take on the McDavid five in a game? Yeah, call it. Call it as it is. Call it as it is. He'll probably. I, I'm surprised he didn't get another game. Yeah, um, I think he may. I don't know if that's over and done with yet. Maybe I don't. Maybe he did. Maybe he didn't. Um, I don't think he did. But I would. I would have gave him an extra game. He is, it's just check him high. Just, just don't do it. You got to. You got to send the message even to the stars. Yeah, I think. I think his speed was the factor in that one. Like he came in a little too hot. Yeah, he came. Yeah, he came in like a wrecking ball. That's for sure. <laughs> he was Miley Cyrus, one hundred percent. Like he was oh, just yeah. flying through that check. You knew exactly what. Uh, in my opinion, he knew exactly what he was doing when uh, when all that happened. But uh, uh, I don't know, man. It's a pretty crazy, uh, pretty thick, crazy thing going on in the NHL right now. And you, know, you said, I'm hoping that the Leafs continue to roll. And Pittsburgh, obviously, is you know having another decent year. They've still got uh, they still got Malkin to come back, don't they? Yeah, he's he's skating now. So I mean, throw him into the mix. That <laughs> hopefully they go on a nice run. I mean. Gensel's and Crosby are playing hot right now, so that's kind of their been their offense as of late. Yeah, you ever think there's a time where uh, Sidney Crosby gets um, gets back to like that 82 points in 82 games? Uh, I mean, I could see it. I, it wouldn't shock me if he did do it, but I don't know. He's, I think he's at that point where he's just embracing where he is, and I mean, for a guy like that, now guys want to go to Pittsburgh, so. I mean, he doesn't have to be that 100-point guy there anymore. Yeah. No, I, I agree. And the one team that I really enjoy, I've been enjoying uh, following this year has been uh, the New York Rangers. I knew they were good. I, would, I think it was just a matter of time before they broke out. Um, yeah. I've, I've called it from the beginning. I thought that Kako and Lafreniere are busts. Um, I think that they're doing okay. But, like, I mean, you've got to get more out of your first picks. Um, you know, Panarin's having a hell of a year. He's 26 points in 23 games. Adam Fox has become a stud for you. You know, Chris Kreider is, is good. Zibanejad's still good. Like, I mean, I think the New York, I think the Rangers have a really good shot of being a hell of a team if they continue if they continue on the run they're going on. Yeah, for sure. I I really like um, I really like Fox. He's uh, he's turning into that elite defenseman. You know, I I almost want to put him with that Nick Lidstrom longevity for a career for him. No, well, I hope so. And like I said, we I, I hope that happens. But you know what, brother? Time is our enemy, as <laughs> always. Which means we got to thank everybody for watching Off the Puck Podcast and watching it on the TV show. It's Saturday nights, 9 p.m. on channels T on 20 and 13 Rogers, Tri-Cities, St. Thomas, and London. You can also find us on Spotify, iTunes, everywhere you can download us a podcast. Make sure you're checking us out. Follow on all of our socials, YouTube, Facebook. All of, Make sure you guys can check in on our live recordings every Monday at 9 p.m. I want to thank Stefan Legion for joining us, assistant coach of the Sea Dogs out in the QMJHL. Make sure you, you, that you're following them. Check them out. Make sure he, I think he's going to have a hell of a coaching career. Again, thanks for Mikey Walker for helping us out tonight. I'm your host, Tyler Fines. Matt Huddle's our producer. Marty Zilstra's in the, he's made the music. The music sounds banging. This is Off the Puck Hockey. Have a good night. Make sure to check out our past shows from previous weeks on our YouTube. Facebook, or Mixed Cloud channels. You can always catch up on podcasts while checking out our FHN Network channel on YouTube or Facebook. Or you can listen to an audio copy of our past shows on our Mixed Cloud channel at FHN underscore network. The FHN Network, the future of entertainment.